You are here, moving in. 
worship you and we praise you and we give you thanks, Lord, for the opportunity, Lord, to come into your house, to sit at your feet, to see your face, Lord. Father, uh, we desire most of all your presence, Lord. Not the things that you give us, Lord, even, not even though there are so many things heavy on our hearts, Lord. We, we bring so much, God, to the table today, God, with us, Lord. There are hurts, Lord. There are habits. There are hang-ups. There are struggles. There's difficulties. There's challenges, Lord. There's people that lack peace today in life, Lord. There are people that are uncertain about their relationship with you, God. There are people that are struggling in their families and marriages, Lord. There's so much, Lord. And Father, we, we know that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. We know, Father, that, that nothing is too difficult for you, Lord. We know that you can step in and you can, you can step in and you do heal and restore, God. But sometimes all of these things, Father, that, that we, we seek, Lord, we, we forget that we, we need to do what Mary did and just sit at your feet in, in your presence, Lord. Because once we find you, Father, once we find you in the midst of all that's going on, when we find you and we're really at your feet, when, when, when we've got your attention and you've got our attention, when we're locking eyes, God, things change, Lord. All of a sudden, all the difficulties, all the challenges and the struggles that seem so big, Lord, they, they begin to shrink, God. Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. There's nothing too difficult for you today, God. So, Lord, we, we don't want to be distracted, Lord, like Peter was with the waves, Father, because everybody has waves in their life. Everybody has storms. You said that in this world we'll have trouble, God, but you said, remember that I've overcome the world, Father. So we want to fix our eyes on you, Father. I don't even, even think I could imagine, Lord, in this crowd of people who and what is going on in lives, but I know, Father, that you're the healer, I know that you're the restorer. I know that you are the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper. I believe that you are the light in the darkness. And, and even if I don't see, even if I don't feel, God, it doesn't, you never sleep, it says. You never slumber. You never stop working, God. So, Father, we give you praise today. I pray for those that are unable to be here, for those that are homebound, Father, for those that are sick, Lord. For those that, God, they're just struggling right now, I just pray for their, your presence to be over them, God. Lord, thank you for allowing us these quiet moments, Lord, to, to intentionally, God, <laughs> to stop, be quiet before you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people say, amen. amen. Wow. <coughs> Silence is golden, right? But I, I notice something that when we get silent before the Lord, sometimes it's a, it's a struggle for people to all of a sudden in that quietness to, to uh, just be still and, and, uh, and, and walk upstairs. And, and you lose all concept of physical motion. Um, I do want to um, let you know that uh, Jimmy Dale will be here on the 19th. Um, of, of January, he and I were talking um, because uh, he likes to not be too close to the New Year, so we uh, he planned next week, but I, of course, have a granddaughter coming, and so I'm not going to be here. And uh, he says, well, I don't really want to be there if you're not there. And so I said, well, well can the 19th work? And he said, that'll be fine. So he's telling all of his clan. So just so those, uh, those of you that might be here this morning expecting to see Billy, I mean, Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy, he's not here today. He'll, he'll be back in a few weeks, and so I want to make sure that you know that. We're in the middle of, a, of an all-in series. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, guys. Yeah, we'll do that at the end of the service, okay, for communion. Uh, so we'll, we will do that at the end of the service, okay? Um, so we're in an all-in series, and we're, we're in Matthew 14. If you've got your Bibles, there's an insert in your... Uh, 
bulletin, and uh, we'll do a real quick review from last week, and then we'll move forward into to the new week. Um, the story is in Matthew, basically, remember that Jesus has told the disciples to get in the boat and go across to the other side. So basically, he's given this, them this command to go across, they're in a the boat, and then as they move out, Jesus then dismisses the crowd, and then he goes, and he does what is most important, he begins to pray. Literally, Jesus says, I need to spend some time with my father. Hey, you guys, get in the boat, go across uh, the lake, and I'll meet you on the other side. And so he dismisses everybody. Well, then a storm comes up, uh, and it starts to, it starts to, the boat starts to get being capsized by the waves, and all the disciples are in the boat. And uh, then Jesus is, of course, he's walking across the water. Uh, he is he walking on the water, and uh, they, they see Jesus, but they mistake him and they think he's a ghost. Um, and then at this point, there's a place where uh, 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 they're looking at him. And, and uh, of course, Peter wants to walk on water too. And he asks the Lord for a command to come out and, and join him. And Jesus says, come out, join me. And he begins to walk on water. And, and we know the story from there. I, I want us to keep on that thought. And again, it's Matthew 14. Uh, Fully devoted followers of Christ, that is part of our mission and vision as a church. We believe in developing fully devoted followers of Christ, helping people to, to really grow in their faith. And so in this story, we see that, that if you're a fully devoted follower of Christ, you recognize God's presence. That there are times in our lives, like the storms that the disciples were in, there are times in our life that, that, that we miss God's presence because all we see is the storm. So it takes eyes of faith, by the way, to recognize when Jesus is around. It takes eyes of faith to realize that even when I don't see him, he's working. Even when I don't feel him, he's working. He never, never stops for me. His presence is never stopped. You have to have eyes of faith. And then every time, by the way, these disciples said yes to their calling, they experienced the power of God in their life. So you and I, whenever we have these challenges in life, when God is calling us to walk on water and to trust Him, we will experience God's power in the middle of our lives. Also, fully devoted followers of Christ discern between, by the way, there is a difference between faith and foolishness. You and I, because we have, we have the Word of God. Amen? Everybody say, we got the Word of God. We've got prayer. We got the Holy Spirit. We got the body of Christ. We got worship. We have all of these things. And because of that, we are able to discern between an authentic call from God and a foolish impart, uh, impulse on my own. Literally, we can, un we can know what's really authentically from God and, and what's not from God. Um, courage, by the way, alone is not enough to to just step out on the water. It must be accompanied by wisdom and discernment. The third thing we talked about last week is fully devoted followers of Christ, they get out of the boat, okay? So if, if you're going to follow Jesus, you can't sit in the boat. There's just no way to follow Jesus. Jesus wasn't in the boat. Did you notice that? He was on the water. So if you want to be where Jesus is at, what do you got to do? You got to get out of the boat. Um, and if you get out of the boat, guess what? There's a chance what? You'll sink. There's a chance you'll get wet. There's a chance that you'll fail. But if you stay in the boat, what are you guaranteed? You will never walk on water. You will never experience the full presence of God and what he wants to do. So you have to ask yourself, we talked about this last week, what's your boat? Whatever the, your boat is, whatever that keeps you so comfortable that you don't want to give it up, even if it means going on this great adventure with Jesus. And that's what was on Peter's mind. I want to go on this great adventure with Jesus. I want to, I want to walk on the water with him. The, the fourth thing is, fully devoted followers of Christ expect problems, okay? Um, amen. Thank you. Someone said amen to us. Uh, you can expect problems. Jesus told the disciples, in this world you're going to have troubles. We've got to remember that we can expect problems when we, when, we, when we are going out and stepping out on the water and following Christ. We can expect uh, waves. We can ex expect wind. Somehow, still today, troubles still have the power to catch us by surprise. We're thinking, we go along and we're following Jesus and we're, we're living our life and we're reading our Bibles and we're praying and, and we're coming to church and we're going to small groups and, and we're growing. But for some reason, something comes, a wave, and it catches us by surprise. And because of the wind and the waves and the challenge, some people decide never to leave the boat. It's comfortable. It's safe. 
Everything, by the way, is risky. Amen? Amen. Everything is risky. And we talked about risk lock. What things being risk, what are the risks we would take to walk on water? Sometimes there are these risk locks. There are these things because it's too risky, it prevents us from stepping out of the boat. So now we're going to move into part two of, of what it means to be a fully devoted follower of Christ. And I, I think these are just amazing thoughts, except, by the way, fear as a price for growth, okay? If you, uh, if, if you, if you have made a choice to follow Jesus, and if you've made a choice to grow, um, then this, these choices to follow Jesus and the choices to grow also is this choice for the constant reoccurrence of fear, okay? Fear is, by the way, fear is, is a part of life. It says that um, the disciples get into the boat and they face the storm, okay? So there's fear there. And they see Josh, Jesus walking on the water. What do they do? They're afraid because they think he's a ghost. And it says that Jesus spoke to them in 1427 saying, take courage in God's eye. So what did he say? Do not be afraid. All right? So every time that we fear something when God is calling us, there is a voice immediately saying, do not be afraid. I am with you. Jesus says, the disciples were afraid. Jesus says, don't be afraid. Peter, he begins to gird up his loins, ask permission to go overboard, and, and he sees the winds, and automatically, what is he? Afraid. Okay? Jesus says, don't be afraid. The question is, do you think that that's the last time that Jesus, uh, that last time that Peter will experience fear in his life? Remember when Peter was going to go out and give a message and he didn't know what to say? And Jesus said, what? You go, you show up, and I will give you the words. Right? What is the greatest fear of us sharing our faith with people? We don't know what to say. We're fearful of sharing our faith because we don't know what to say. But have you ever thought that as he said to Peter, he says to us today, I'm, I'm not just going to tell you everything. I need you to show up and I need you to be in place. And then at that point, I'll give you the words to say. I, I think about the, the thing uh, here, here uh, probably the last conversation that, that Jesus has with Peter. It's found in John 21. And Peter was listening when, and he said, Jesus said, when you were younger, you, you made your own choices. And you went where you pleased, but one day when you are old, others will tie you up and escort you where you would not choose to go, and you will spread out your arms. Do you think that, that when Jesus was telling Peter that, that there was a little fear coming out? I mean, literally, Jesus is telling Peter how he's going to die. He's literally saying, if you follow me, you're going to die. Uh, uh, notice here, I mean, Jesus words to Peter in this call to be this fully devoted follower of Christ. He doesn't pull any punches. He doesn't... Following Peter, it means suffering. Peter, following Jesus means sacrifice. And, and there'll be some times when you're fearful, but remember, you don't have to be afraid. I'm, I'm with you. Yes, in this world, you're going to have trouble. Peter's suffering is a common theme in the life of the disciple, but you don't have to be afraid if you're following Jesus. But here is the deep truth of being that fully devoted follower of Christ that God is calling us to be. Each time I want to grow, it will involve me going into new territories, taking on new opportunities and challenges. Unless I step out there and take on these new opportunities and challenges, I will never grow. I was talking with the barista this morning early at Safeway at Starbucks. She was talking about her life, and I asked her, I said, what's your goals for the, for the life, oh, for this year? She goes, well, I really have some. And so we began to talk, talk in, in those, and I said, you know what? I'm going to hold you accountable because I know what you want to do now. But I realized that there's going to be some fear. Are you afraid of some of the heat? She goes, yeah. And I said, well, you know what? If you want to grow, you might as well realize that you're going to have to face fear because every time you grow there is this challenge there are these opportunities but it's also to grow means that you're going to face fear sometimes so each time i i do this I, that i want to grow i will experience fear again as susan jeffers says this the fear will never go away isn't that comforting today <laughs> The fear will never go away as long as I continue to grow. 
as long, as you gotta put that last part in there, as long as I continue to grow. We've got to remember Philippians 4.13 that says, I can do all things through who? Yeah. Through Christ who gives me strength. I realize that never, by the way, seems a very, very long time, doesn't it? Never. And it really probably isn't the greatest news. But knowing that, you can now give up trying to make fear go away. Have any, has anybody ever tried to make fear go away? We've all done that. We're trying to make fear to go away. We don't want to be afraid. Anybody want to be afraid? I mean, how many people, I'm, I'm 61, I've got a nightlight. <laughs> well, I thought that was funny too. <laughs> you know? Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> fear. Fear and growth go hand in hand. I was, I was looking up some, uh, some meanings of fear, and it says, fear is forget everything and run. Or face everything and rise. Amen. Isn't that good? You, you may want to write that down. Forget everything and run. Or face everything and rise. And I told, I, I told a, my uh, barista this morning, I said, Now, I want you to know that fear is false evidence appearing real. Your fear will appear real. It will, it will almost seem so real. But it's not. It's false. You can do anything. You can, you can go back to school. You can get your degrees. You can do this. And, you know, God will help you. And, uh, uh, but the question is, will you let faith or will you let fear motivate your life? Fear and growth go, to hand, go in hand in hand. It's like macaroni in, peanut butter in, okay, Lucille in, Ricky. Come on. You know, Lucille and Ricky Ricardo? Boy, I'm really... I was trying to find things that go together, but I guess Lucy and Ricky must have not gone together very, very well. So this decision to grow, it always involves a choice, by the way. To grow involves a choice between risk and comfort. Okay, risk and comfort. So comfort, the boat. Risk, what? Stepping out on the water. So, um, so to be a fully devoted follower of Christ, we got to renounce what? we got to renounce this comfort as the ultimate value of my life. Because we love comfort, don't we? We love comfort. Um, Jesus said, and what, it, what it means to follow me, he said, uh, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. you got to embrace my cross daily as your own. It's not an option. Like I, You don't get to pick up your cross once in a while. It's daily pick up my cross and surrender to my ways. Mark 12, 30 says this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That, that's part of it. Loving God with everything you have, but also not just loving God, but loving each other. I mean, that, those are the things that, that Jesus is talking about here. But we love comfort. We even have like, we have a, like lazy boys these days, right? Anybody got a lazy boy? Like it's one of the most popular cheers uh, ever. Yeah. yeah. And we got language all about this. We have, uh, so when you go home, what do you do? What do you do in front of the television? You veg out. In your what? Uh, I got it, good. So the 11 disciples, what would they be called? Wait, I'm sorry, I skipped ahead. What do we call people that lay on the couch all the time? Okay, thank you. So the 11 disciples can be called boat potato tots. They can be called boat potatoes. Right? They were comfortable in their boat, right? Oh, uh, millions of people in churches could be called pew potatoes. I'm sorry. You understand, right? I know. Don't, don't go anywhere, Susie, on me there. Yeah. I'm leaving. Don't go Susie on me. Yeah, I, when we switched, I, she loved her pews so much that when we decided that we wanted to do a little bit more multi-purpose in here, um, we took out the pews and uh, we gave them, by the way, we did not throw pews away. We actually donated our pews to another church. We helped them get them. And I even took two out to Susie's house to put on her front porch so that she could have church out on her front porch. <laughs> I've been wondering why she hasn't been coming so often. <laughs> uh, just joking. 
Yeah. So, so everybody, we we want some we want we want some of the comfort associated with spirituality. See, I, I want grace. Anybody want grace? The comfort of grace. I want the comfort of mercy. I want the comfort of forgiveness. And I, oh, I love the blessings, right? I want all these comforts, but we don't want to take any risk. We want we we don't want to take any challenges that go along with actually being all in and following Jesus. We literally want to take Jesus and put him on a shelf sometimes when we leave the house because we don't want him involved in everything that we do. Are we all in? That's the question. See, Jesus is still looking for people like people like Peter who will get out of the boat. The point is, you got to get out of the boat, by the way, a little every day, okay? These are called, you know, uh, anybody watch the movie, What About Bob? You ever What About Bob? It's all about taking steps. And he's, you know, he, the whole movie is about taking one little step at a time. And a little every day. And then, then I want you to know that steps of faith part waters. Steps of faith, little steps remove that barrier of fear. Literally, Jesus is still looking for people that... Uh, like in Philippians 3, it says, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I, he's looking for people that will press on to make it their own because Christ is, Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, I forget what lies behind and I forget the past, but I strain forward to what lies ahead. I'm going to press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm, I'm not content in staying in the boat. I'm not content in staying where I'm at. I'm going to press forward. But important, both choices, risk and comfort, grow into habits. Right? Anybody got uh, any habits you want to take care of this year? It takes 21 days to uh, break a habit. Did you know that? 21 days, that's what they say. 21 days, all right? So, Kenny, you and I will take about... 365 days. Yeah. Uh, we break, right? So 21 days. But think about this. It only takes about 15 minutes to, 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 to have to start all over again. But 21 days to, to break a bad habit. But think about this. Every time you get out of the boat, every time that Jesus calls you to follow him and you take a risk, guess what? You're more likely to get out of the boat again. Because you're developing that habit. You're developing that habit. Okay, habit. Oh boy, just so much. It's the chicken. Yeah, it's the chicken illustration. Oh no, the steak, steak illustration. Yeah, let's use the steak one. So I, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, I'm laying in bed on, uh, bed on. Uh, it was a chicken. Uh, yeah, it's so funny. Um, so I'm laying in bed. It's about 12:30. Katie had come down. Um, we had dinner together. I put all the chicken in Tupperware dishes and had it cooling so that it could go in the refrigerator. And I went to bed, of course, before she did, and I assumed that she went in the kitchen, probably saw that that and put it in the, in the refrigerator. It was the best, best barbecue chicken ever. It was amazing. Um, and then about 12.30, I hear this voice in my head that says, you need to go put the stuff in the refrigerator. I'm thinking, it's just a voice. Uh, it's nothing. Well, the next day I find out that the voice was real. If I would have just taken one little step of faith, I would have gone out there and I would have saved myself the waste. Because one of my goals this year is that I don't want to waste food I, because there's so much hunger in our world. But I learned a lesson about hearing. Okay? So then... The other night, um, Virginia got sick uh, on Saturday, and so Saturday night I'd been working out here all day, and I went home, and it was about eight o'clock, and I still had things to do at the church last night. So I, was, I mean, uh, Friday night. So I was going to go um, Friday night. I was going to go and uh, come back and do all the books, get all of our. You, by, by the way, there's a lot of work up here. Get all the music books together, get everything. Thing. Well, my wife calls me about eight thirty, and she says, "How's everything going?" We talk a little bit. And I said, well, I've got a few things to go. And she says, you know what? You need to stay home. I said, why? I still got two hours before it's midnight. She said, no, you need to stay home. Stop. So I put up the phone, and of course, I was going to go do my own thing. 
and do the books, but then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit checked me and says, listen to your wife. And I thought, okay, I'm going to listen to my wife. She might be right. <laughs> but could God have known that, that Virginia was not going to be feeling well on Saturday morning and knew that I was going to be over here working on something that we would have to change on Saturday? Does, does, see what I'm saying? So every time you start listening to God's voice as a spiritual believer and you take those steps, you'll be more apt to get out of the book. But the same thing is true. On the other hand, every time you resist his voice, every time you choose to stay in the boat, rather than his call, the voice will what? Get smaller and smaller. That's why the Holy Spirit said in Hebrews, today when you hear his voice, don't what? Harden your hearts or don't turn off your ears. The sixth thing is master failures. For the boat and followers of Christ, master failure management. Um, so here's the question for us today. Did Peter fail? Okay, did, when we look at this story, did Peter fail? And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. So let's make an observation about failure. Failure is not an event, but rather a judgment about an event. Failure is not something that happens to us or a label we attach to things. It is a way we think about outcomes. Wow. Isn't that cool? In Proverbs 23, 7, the Lord began to start dealing with me. It says, for as a man thinks, as you calculate, as you gauge, as you evaluate, as you assess within himself, so he is. So if I calculate that this is a failure, guess what? It's going to be a failure. It, it's a judgment of what I see. So did Peter fail? I suppose in a way he did. His faith wasn't strong enough. Who's his? His doubts were stronger. He saw the wind. He took his eyes off where they should have been. He sank. He failed. But here is what I really think. There's a boat. There's 12 people. Well, minus one now. I believe that there are 11 Bigger failures sitting in the boat. And the eleven, they failed quietly. They failed privately. They failed, their failure went unnoticed, unobserved, uncriticized. Only Peter knew the shame of public failure. Think about it. Only he knew the shame of public failure. They're watching, he's going down. But there are only two other things that Peter know. One is the glory of walking on water. When he said, come and got out of the boat, he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Now think about this. He alone knew what it was to attempt to do what he was not capable of doing on his own. The impossible made possible. When Peter stepped out on the water and was looking at Jesus, he says, now I understand why the blind see. Now I understand why the lame walk, why the deaf hear. I know why the lame leopards are healed. I understand how the, I mean, all of a sudden the dots begin to kick. He, I literally, I'm walking on water. The impossible is made possible. This feeling of euphoria, of being powered by God to actually walk on waters. And once you're on walking on water, you'll never, you'll never forget that. But the second thing, by the way, was this. The glory of being lifted up by Jesus in a moment of desperate need. But seeing the winds, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. Peter knew that Jesus was wholly adequate to save him from the waves of the sea. And when you step out in faith and when you continue to grow in your faith, just remember that Jesus is wholly adequate. And the only way you're going to experience that is not in the boat. It's when you're walking out on the water. He had, by the way... Peter had a shared moment, a shared connection. See, shared connection. This is powerful. This is what happened to you that night that you began to pray. Nemo, that was a shared connection. That's what happens when we step out on the waters. There's this shared connection. And all of a sudden, there's this bigger picture that we don't see. But, but 
Peter was experiencing this shared connection and this trust in Jesus that none of the others in the boat had. See, the worst failure is not to sink in the waves. The worst failure is to never get out of the boat. Fully devoted followers of Christ, by the way, those of us that are fully devoted, listen, we see failure as an opportunity to grow. Michael Jordan says this, I can accept failure. Everyone fails at some times, but I can't accept not trying. Zig Ziglar says this, if you learn from defeat, you haven't really lost. And then Winston Churchill says this, success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. So fully devoted followers of Christ, those, those are Christ-like disciples. We see failure as an opportunity to grow. So as soon as Peter asked for help, immediately Jesus begins to stretch out his hand and took a hold of him. And Jesus helps Peter physically and pulling him up out of the water. But more importantly, he helps Peter grows spiritually by what does he do? He points out the problem. He says, immediately, he pulls him up and he says, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? But the only way for our faith to grow is on the water, not in the comfort of the boat. It is only after these moments that, that they got back into the boat. So I, I love this. In the privacy of the windy water and in the strong right hand of Jesus, Jesus gently helps Peter locate the source of his problem. He says, Peter, you lack faith. Peter, you got your eyes off me. You were looking at the waters. See, I don't think that Jesus was scolding Peter. He wasn't, he wasn't belittling Peter. He was pointing out a truth to help him grow. You got your eyes off of me. If you get your eyes off of me, you're going to go down. But if you keep your eyes on me, you're going to walk on water every time. If you focus on the storm, you're going to go down. But if you focus on the Savior, you'll be safe. It was Peter's willingness to risk failure that helped him to grow. So, part of our all-in this, this whole next year is actually about putting ourselves in positions to fail. Do you like that? But it's true. We've got to put ourselves in that position. We have to have a willingness to step out on the water. Amen? Peter also put himself in a position to fail, and because he put himself in a position to fail, it put him in a position to grow. Failure, by the way, is, is indispensable. It's irreplaceable part of learning to grow. Failure, by the way, does not shape you. You might want to fill this, fill this in here. You may want to write this down. Failure does not shape you. The way you respond to failure shapes you. Okay? The way you respond. Um, everybody knows the story of, of Sir Edmund Hillary. Uh, he made several um, unsuccessful attempts. He was, he was scaling Mount Everest uh, before he finally succeeded. And uh, one day he stood at the base of Mount Everest, and he was really, I mean, he had, he had been defeated over and over again. And he literally looked up at Mount Everest, and he, he, said, he said, you know what, I'm going to defeat you. And he looked up at that giant of the mountain, Mount Everest. He looked up and he says, he says, here's the problem, Mount Everest. You stopped growing, but I haven't. And so literally, every time Hillary climbed, he failed. And every time he failed, he learned. And every time he learned, he grew and tried again. And one day, he didn't fail. Are you still growing? Have we let failure stop us? Are we still stepping out on the water? Are we still trusting? Are we still growing? The eighth thing is, as fully devoted followers of Christ, we've got to learn to wait on the Lord. By the way, this, this story about risk is also a story about waiting. Literally, we have to wait on the Lord to receive power to walk on the water. We have to wait on the Lord to make the storm disappear. I like what Psalms 46, 10 says, Cease striving and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. By the way, I will be exalted among, among your lives. Amen? I will be exalted in the earth. 
So we got to wait on the Lord. We got to chill out sometimes. Amen. We got to we got to get our hands off and we got to get out of the boat and just trust God. I believe, by the way, waiting on the Lord is the hardest part of trusting. Because when I talk about waiting, I'm not talking about waiting around. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not willing to wait around because waiting around is inactive. There's a difference in waiting actively and waiting around, which is inactive. This is about putting ourselves with utter vulnerability in His hands. It's. It's literally. By by the way, it's we as a people saying. God, we're going to step out of the boat this year, and we're going to we're going to listen to you. We're going to we're going to listen to your call to step out and and out of our comfort zone and, and trust you. We're going to take risks, um, so that basically we're saying to God this year, if you don't show up, we're going to fail. Right? That's what I'm talking about. Because it's it's easy for us to manage life and and to work things out. But but I'm talking about stepping out of the boat and saying, God, if you don't. If you don't show up, we're, we're going to be in, in a world of hurt. So the ninth thing, fully devote, being a fully devoted follower of Christ brings a deeper connection with God. In closing, Jesus is, is still looking for people who will get out of the boat. For those of you that are guests with us today, that is part of our, our mission and our vision is to develop fully devoted followers of Christ. Our, our mission is to make Christ-like disciples. Our, our mission is never just to gather people here in this room and, and, and have just great worship services and, and good teachings. But our, 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 our mission and vision is also to gather people so that they can go out into the world, so they can scatter, so that they can be light, so they can be who they've been called to be in the world to make a difference. So literally, being a full, fully devoted follower of Christ brings a deeper connection with God. So why risk? But why risk it? You might be saying, why should I come tonight to All In, but why should I risk it? The only way to real growth is to get out of the boat. If you stay in comfort, you're not going to grow. If you stay in the boat. So it, the only way to real growth is you've got to take risks. It, it's the only way to true, truly develop your faith is to say, God, I, I'm ready for an adventure with you. I want to I step out. Even if it means a, a chance that I'll fail. Because I know that you'll be there to pick me up. Every single time. It is the alternative. By the way, I see so many people that are bored as Christians. They're stagnated. They're, they, for some reason, somewhere along the line, they, they, we call ourselves Christians, but we're, we're just like, we are literally pew potatoes. We just come and we sit and we really are not really connected in this great adventure out on this water that God's calling us to. But also, why risk it? It's a part of discovering and obeying your call. So when you step out there, you're going to learn your purposes. You're going to learn your plans of, of what God has for you. But there is one reason that trumps all of these. And it's this. Jesus is not in the boat. Jesus is in the water. And if you want the deeper connection... You got to get out of the boat. I love when we gather for holy hugs. I love this kind of stuff. I believe that the one of the greatest parts of my week is actually a highlight for me is to come here, show the word of God, sing beautiful songs, pray together. But I love it more when we scatter to get out of the boat. Go. I love it when we 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 work and we see all of these children during VBS come to know the Lord. I, I love when we feed. People at Thanksgiving. I love our, our outreaches at Christmas time. I love our uh, Valentine's thing where we, we, we have this pizza make and bake and we talk to couples. I, I love all of these things. Probably the scattering part of my life is more important. I mean, I love that part. I love to gather, but, but see, Jesus is out in where it's dark, He's out where it's wet, He's out where it's dangerous. He's not, he's not in the boat. So, how about you? When was the last time you got out of the boat? I'm just going to read this and I, I want to close today. Um, I, I put a lot of uh, 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 
Virginia and Katie, if you come up here and uh, do the um, shelter. So I put some papers down here. It's, it's about 25 after. Uh, I also put communion down here um, for two reasons. Um, I think some of the best ways for us to um, move forward is to actually write something down. That's why they say journaling is so important. You got to journal. And so we got our prayer request board back in here, and then there's some prayer requests here. And uh, so I just want to pose some questions this morning. Um, and have, be open, have your heart open to this. Um, because I truly believe that, that this group of people that we have here, and, and there's many that are not here this morning, that this group of people here have the potential to change the dynamics of our community and our, our world. I really do believe that. I do believe that we're, um, that he's a way maker and he wants to do something in and through us. Um, each and every one of us, um, God's calling us in different ways to get out of the boat, but, but all of those are to serve one purpose, him and his kingdom call and his glory. So I believe that God's general method of growing a deep, adventurous faith in us is by asking us to get out of the boat. So what does that look like? More than hearing, by the way, a great message or reading a great book, God uses real-world challenges to develop our ability to trust Him, you know? I'm thinking about how, the, how, much, how many people don't have to deal with water because there were, there were, there were people that said, we're going we're to put wells in all these places. And, and I'm watching people, they're all over the world. A simple week, we open up a tap, we get drinking water. But there are, there are countries that have zero drinking water, but people have said, instead of saying, we don't have the money, or we don't know how to do this, there were people that literally have stepped out of the boat, and they're putting wells everywhere so people have fresh drinking water. But they would have never happened. Did they have any failures and fears along the way? Oh, I bet the stories are incredible. Yeah. Wouldn't it be great for us to be able to erase the hunger in Coolidge and Florence and in Casa Grande? Sounds like a big job, right? I don't know any, if you guys know Pastor Jerry, but Pastor Jerry, that was his thing, uh, uh, and Pastor Jerry uh, Casa Grande. But, I mean, literally, he's touched millions and millions of lives in the last 20 years. We can't even count the number of people that he's provided food and resources for families. Unreal. But why? Because he stepped out of the boat. Because the church steps out of the boat. Think about that. This is how we develop our trust in him. We tend to seek a world of comfort. We, we try to construct manageable lives with some security and predictability, right? And maintain to maintain this illusion that we're kind of in control. But then God passes by and he shakes up everything. And that's where I'm at today. He's just shaking me all up. The call to get out of the boat involves crisis, opportunity, often failure, generally fear, sacrifice, and some suffering. Always the calling to a task too big for us. But there's no other way to grow in faith and to partner with God. Maybe there was a time, by the way, think about this, when you regularly you were walking on water. A time when your heart was much like Peter and you said, command me, tell me to come to you and I'm going to do everything. There was a time when you would risk sharing your faith even when it meant rejection. A time when you would risk giving everything even when it meant sacrifice. A time when you would risk even if it meant the possibility of failures. Sometimes, by the way, you're sore. Sometimes you sank, but you lived on the edge of your faith. May I say with confidence, God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life. This is not, a, this is not by the way, this is not a call to make our church bigger. This is a call to us as fully devoted followers of Christ to move out to the water where Jesus is. This is a call for us to step in and start living our lives in total surrender to Him. May I say this with confidence, when you fail, by the way, and we all will fail, I'm confident that there are going to be times that we're going to fail this year. Jesus will always be there. From the very beginning of the book of Genesis, it's always been about two things, the failure of people and the faithfulness of God. From the very beginning, when God could have given up, he said, no, I'm going to be faithful to the very end. I'm going to be faithful.
And so I want to encourage you this morning as we as we just share this last song, maybe maybe there's someone, something you want to write, something you want to put on there. Um, uh, maybe you just want to come and have communion today. Um, get your heart right. Remember that it's the blood of Christ and it's his body that was broken for us. And, and so take communion today and remember. He said, do this and remember me. So make this a personal time. I mean, I could provide you with communion, but I want you I want you to make that decision to come and have communion and say, God, I'm making this time of communion with you and me today. This is, this is an individual call to say, I, I believe in you. I believe in you have a plan for my life and a purpose. And so just let's spend about four or five minutes in worship and uh, say, okay, God, here you got my heart. I don't know what God's doing, but I know God's moving right now.